How many of you have had a chance to watch the TV series season, The Chosen? Let me see your hand. A oh, smattering of you have. I highly recommend it. People have been recommending it to me for quite some time, and I wasn't interested, frankly, because most of the movies I've watched about Jesus have either been okay, lame, or embarrassing. Uh, I think the Passion of the Christ would be an exception to that, but that one, you know, how many times can you really watch the crucifixion? It's so hard to watch. But the chosen is different. Jesus is so real and fun and compassionate and, and playful and loving and cracks jokes and plays with kids and it's just the way I want to imagine Jesus. And all the backstories of the disciples are so intriguing. We don't know what their backstories were for the most part, but there were backstories. And so to really think about what it was like to transition from whatever they were doing to follow this teacher around Palestine, it's really worth your time. You can find it on YouTube or on the app, the chosen app, and you can cast it to your TV. Crowdfunded. Biggest project ever. You know, 10 million the first season, 10 million for the second season. They're already, already crowdfunded 37% of the third season. There's projected to be seven seasons. And if you start watching it, tell me what you think, because I think it, it is really giving me a fresh perspective of Jesus that I love. It's made me love Jesus more. And anything that makes me love Jesus more, I'm all for that. Amen. There's so many powerful scenes, but one of them was um, the, the episode on the wedding in Canaan, where Jesus turned water to wine. And it's very creatively written, the, the opening scene. Uh, I won't, this will not be a spoiler alert, okay, because <laughs> if you read the Bible, you know it, it happened. <laughs> but, so... The opening scene is a flashback to when Jesus was 12 and his parents thought he was with someone else in their caravan and they left him behind in Jerusalem and, and learned when they are frantically searching for him that he had been in the temple actually teaching the teachers at age 12. And he, he says to his mom, you know, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And she says, but, but it's not time. And he said, well, if not now, when? And it's so sweet when she just kind of takes his face and looks at him tenderly and says, you're going to have to help us through this. Imagine being the mother of the Son of God. And then later, when it's the wedding and, and Mary comes to him to ask because it's such a humiliation that they've run out of wine. <clears throat> and Jesus says to his mom, my time has not come yet. And she says, if not now, when? <laughs> and he loves his mother. And... Yet he knows that although he's done a couple private miracles, he hasn't gone public yet. And when he goes public, everything's going to change. And everything does change after the wedding feast at Canaan. And so there's this tender moment where he asks everyone to leave the, the room after the, all the containers have been filled to the brim with water. And he's con considering what it means to go public now. And it's, it's, it's a really profound moment. I just never really imagined what that would have been like for Jesus to make the decision, okay, now's the time. Jesus actually spoke a lot about time. He would say, my time has not yet come, or the time is not at hand, and then later, the hour is at hand, my time has come. Very conscious of divine timing. God not only created time, he acted in time. The Bible is the account of God acting in the history of the world and the lives of people. The kings of Israel and Judah ruled at defined times, established by God. Jesus was born when Caesar Augustus ruled the Roman Empire, and the Apostle Paul wrote this, Galatians 5, or 4, verse 4, when the time, the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. The set time. We even measure time since the birth of Jesus. You know, Jesus is the dividing point in history, the history of the world. He's the, and, you know, in our lives as well, he becomes a dividing time. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. 
Our challenge, if, if we decide to be followers of Christ, is to establish our priorities, order our priorities, and then budget time to make sure that they continue to be our priorities. Our topic today is we're continuing our Believe series as we're looking at key practices that help us grow spiritually. Our topic is offering my time. We often talk about time, talent, and treasure being precious resources that we can use selfishly or that we can offer to God as acts of worship. Our key verse from our reading this week is Colossians 3.17. Now, some, many of you are reading along the scriptures that prepare us for these messages. We've provided you with resources. Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do, whatever. It's a pretty big word, isn't it? Comprehensive. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus <clears throat> instructed us to have priorities. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. And then he said, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart. Now, in order for that to happen, I must connect with God on a daily basis. I've got, if I'm going to keep him first, if I'm going to love him with all my heart, I've got to read and reflect on his word. I've got to talk to him and try to listen to him in prayer, worship him, not only on Sundays, but with my life recognizing that I'm called to be a steward of all the resources that he's gifted me with, and one of them is time. Realizing that whatever I do, as that text says, is to be done for his honor, for his glory. Think about this. My priorities are re revealed in my calendar and my bank statement. I've, I've said that many times over the years. I used to say, in my calendar, in my checkbook. But if you looked at my checkbook these days, you would think my only priority in life is getting my dogs groomed. Because <laughs> that's basically the only check I ever write. So I changed it to bank statement. If you look at your calendar, if you look at your bank statement, it will tell you something about your priorities. Do, do I put God first? Can I, you know, it's one thing to say I do, but if my calendar and my bank statement don't show that that's true, then is it really true? Jesus made it a priority to start every day with his Father and then give his life away serving others. And I want to be more like him. Time is a valuable commodity. The Greeks understood this truth, and they had two words for time. And both of these words show up in our Bible. First is chronos. Or they would say, roll the R, chronos. Um, and this is sequential time, and you can see it in the word chronological. See it there? That's from the Greek, chronos time, chronological time. It means normally the way we talk about time, minutes, seconds, hours, days. But the other word is kairos. And this is a special word which talks about opportunities, a window of time, an opportune time, or the right time. It, it has to do with a period of time that opens itself up, and one needs to make the most of it when it does, and not miss the opportunity. The problem is we do not operate, for the most part, on Kairos time. We fill our calendars with one task and one meeting after another, one event, until it's full. And as a result, many times we miss the kairos moments. We only have so much chronos time. You know, chronologically, this, this is something, by the way, we all have the same amount of time. Sometimes we can, we can schedule our life way more busier than someone else, but that we all have the same, much, same amount of time to steward. But we have even fewer of these kairos moments. And that's why Paul tells us to wake up and pay attention and to watch how we live our life. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 from the English Standard Version says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Notice the word walk. Paul uses it seven times in Ephesians. This is the last. 
And up until this point, he has hammered home the idea that the way we walk is important. That is the way we live. The NIV translates the way we live. It, because we used to walk in darkness. If we come to faith in Christ, we now walk in the light. And he says there's basically two ways you can walk in this verse. He says an unwise or a wise way. That's why he, he encourages us to make the best use of our time. The word for time here. And I used the ESV because it tends to do, be a very literal translation, word by word literal, which sometimes is good and sometimes it's better to have the meaning rather than the actual literal translation. As you'll see in a minute, the NIV translates it a little different but, but captures the meaning. But the Greek word here for time is kairos. You don't pick that up, just uh, reading it in English, but what God is saying is that Jesus' followers are people who watch and are alert and are aware, watch for moments or seasons of opportunity. And when they see them, they snatch them up. One translation says, redeeming the time is how we walk wisely. Redeeming. We redeem the time. In other words, we seek to make the best use of our time. And the reason we need to make good use of our time is the text says the days are evil. Impurity, greed, sexual immorality, lack of acknowledgement of God, all those things permeated the days of Paul, and so it is today. If we allow ourselves to become too distracted by the world around us, we will likely be missing these kairos moments that come our way. And so the text says, look, look, look carefully how we walk. We don't want to waste our opportunities. We don't want to waste our lives. Now, now, notice the way that the NIV translates this. I usually use the NIV in teaching, and I indicate if I'm not on, on the screens. But it says, it translates the same verse, be careful then how you live. It's the word walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I think the NIV translators decided to use the word opportunity to show this is kairos that's being talked about here, not just chronological time. Jesus was a master at making the most of every opportunity. He was a master at knowing the difference between chronos and kairos. And there were times when he was hurried because there was a chronos situation that seemed to call for time as the essence, if you will. Sometimes people say Jesus was never in a hurry. I don't think I agree with that. I think sometimes he rushed like an ambulance driver to help people in need. But even in those times of chronos, importance, sometimes kairos interrupted. And Jesus had the awareness that we so often lack to know that God was working inside and outside of appointments, the calendar, and the clock. We see an example of this, I believe, in Mark chapter 5. We find one of these times in Jesus' ministry, beginning with verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Darius came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with them. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. I'd like to invite you to try to get yourself into the emotion of this story. Imagine this father. Maybe you have kids at home or you've had kids at home. And if so, you know how you would feel if they became suddenly seriously ill. Put yourself in this desperate father's place for a minute if you can. And as we read this story, it's actually found in three different gospels. And so they all add different details to get the story in stereo. You've got to read all three accounts. And as we do, we learn that this little girl was the pride of her father's life. She was 12 years old. She was an only son, or daughter rather, and she was just at the edge of childhood and womanhood, likely devoted to her dad and he to her. One day she's running around playing, loving life, and then she starts coughing. And then the next day, she's lying in bed with a fever. And then before long, her parents can't figure out why she's burning up with fever and gasping for every breath. Nowadays, we have plenty of options, obviously. We have well-trained doctors and 24-hour emergency treatment and numerous 
medications and x-rays and sonograms and ultrasounds and CAT scans and second opinions and Mayo Clinic. They didn't have any of that. They had some doctors, but, you know, they and did the best they could, but they mostly guessed and applied natural remedies, and sometimes it helped, and sometimes not. Sometimes it made things worse. So this father's hours were filled with constant dread as he watched his dear daughter slowly fading away. Then he remembered the teacher. News was out, spreading throughout the region. This teacher could work miracles, they say. The reports come in that he'd healed a leper and a paralytic by just the power of his word. Of course, he's controversial. Many of the religious leaders had declared him a heretic, and, and this father has his reputation to consider. After all, he's a synagogue ruler, which means he has prestige and influence in the Jewish community. But then, his daughter's more important than his position. If this teacher really has healing powers, he could be the only option left. And so with just a bit of hope flickering in his heart, he went in search of the man named Jesus staying in the town called Capernaum. When he found Jesus, of course, there were crowds pressing around him. Some wanted healing, others strained just to hear his words. Some just wanted to know what was going on. <laughs> and, and a few were desperate, but Nobody more desperate than this man on that day. He pushed and shoved his way through the crowd. He was beyond worrying about manners. Finally makes his way all the way up close to Jesus and flung himself to the ground and cried out, my precious little daughter is dying. Please come at once. If you could just lay your hands on her, she could be healed and live. And I imagine Jesus looking at him with tenderness and concern responding like he was the only one there. Where is she? By all means, let's go to her right now. And so they start off hurrying as best they can, but, but I imagine the father must have been frustrated because there were so many in people insisting to come along and crowding the streets. It's different today. You call 911, ambulance, rush your little one to the hospital, sirens blaring, lights flashing. They had to make it by foot and the crowds were slowing them down as they pressed against Jesus. And then, I'm sure to this, this father's dismay in his desperation, there's an interruption. Mark goes into quite a bit of detail on it. Let me just read you the summary of, from Matthew's account. Matthew 9, 20. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. Now, again, when you read all three of these accounts, you pick up other details. And we learned that people were pushing and pressing against Jesus. And when Jesus suddenly stopped, everyone else stopped to see what he was going to do. And he said, who touched me? And it's a silly question because everyone is jostling around him, and yet they all start denying it. Not me, not me, not me. <laughs> and Peter, who's always quick to speak, he says, come on, Jesus. How can you ask such a thing? Everybody's bumping and pushing and crowding you. How can you say, who touched me? And Jesus ignores him. And he says, somebody touched me. I felt healing power leave me. Only then does this trembling woman their shoulders stooped and a shawl pulled over her face, fall down at his feet and confess that she has suffered miserably from bleeding for 12 years. And she was too embarrassed and afraid to ask for help. And she thought maybe, maybe just maybe, if she just touched the hem of his garment, something might happen. And yes, she admits immediate miraculous healing happened in her body. Jesus, the friend of outcasts, and the marginalized. I imagine him smiling warmly and speaking tender and assuring words to her when he says, it's not my robe that made you well. It's because you put your faith in me. Take heart, daughter. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Now, I don't know, if, but I imagine that that dad right at that moment 
with a dying daughter is very frustrated about this interruption. If people keep stopping Jesus like this, we'll never get there in time. Just imagine that you're rushing your child to the hospital in an ambulance and someone flags down the vehicle and wants to talk to the paramedics about a chronic problem they've been suffering from for 12 years. You'd be frustrated, wouldn't you? He's maybe even angry with this woman at this point and, 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 and saying, let's go, Jesus, come on, let's go. And then he sees faces he does not want to see. Two of the household servants are making their way through the crowd and fear grips his heart and twists his insides. He tries to steal himself for the news he does not want to hear. Mark 5, 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some of the people came from the house of Darius, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Imagine someone giving you that announcement, parents. Your daughter's dead. I see the father gasping, trying to choke back his sudden grief and turning from the crowd. And then a strong hand is on his shoulder and he turns to see through his tears the face of Jesus and hears him saying, please don't be afraid, just keep believing. And even though that does not seem rational, the desperate father grasps onto just a little hint of hope that is renewed in his heart and they journey on quickly. When they arrive, there's the mourners carrying on outside the house. and Jesus hurries right past them, makes his way to the room where the little girl is lying. And he kneels down beside her and takes her limp, little, cold hand into his calloused hands. And he says in Aramaic, Talitha kum, little maiden, it's time to get up. And immediately her eyes open up. And what is the first thing she sees? The smiling face of Jesus right in front of her. And then she sees her parents and jumps up and goes over to give them a big group hug as they cry new tears now, tears of joy and relief. It's a great story that illustrates not only the power and authority of Jesus as the divine son of God, which it does, and not only his tender love and compassion for all who suffer, which it does, but also his willingness to be interrupted for divine appointments. Jesus heard about an emergency. My little daughter is dying, and, and so he went. There, there's time to hurry. And perhaps Darius grabbed Jesus by the hand and tried to drag him through the crowd so he would go faster. This is a Kronos, emergency, time is of the essence. But Kairos intervened. Hurry, 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 stop. Who touched me? Another need. And it could have been very easily to just ignore that interruption. And sometimes we do need to ignore erupt interruptions when we've got an important task. But that's why this takes prayerfulness if we're going to be watching and available for God moments. Due to his sensitivity to his father's business and to the Spirit's promptings, Jesus sensed that this was a Kairos moment, a God moment. And so he stopped. Now, as you consider how you might offer your time to God, I encourage you to be aware of these two types of time because they are both important. Chronos, chrono chrono chronological time, Followers of Jesus who want to steward that well are going to make priorities, order priorities, and then budget time for what's most important. If you don't budget time, you just give leftovers, you might not have time for what's important. What is it? Worship? Prayer? Family? Serving? Involvement in your church? Whatever it is, budget time for it. But also be aware of kairos. Stay open and watchful for divine opportunities, heavenly interruptions, chances to add value to others. The same Father and the same Spirit that prompted Jesus wants to prompt you and me if we'll be available and willing and listening. 
In order to be good stewards of our time, we must learn to number our days. What does that mean? The psalmist David reminds us of the fragility of life and the importance of using our time wisely. Psalm 39, verse 4, he prays, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my ear, years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. In the light of eternity, life is fleeting. It's like your breath on a cold morning. You see it and it's gone. We don't like to think about that, of course. Uh, we want to hang on to life as long as possible, rightly so. But being reminded regularly of this reality is important if we're going to be good stewards of the cur current time that we have. Moses prayed the same prayer as David prayed. In Psalm 90, did you know that, there, uh, uh, that Moses wrote one of the Psalms? There's 150 of them. David wrote most of them, but not all of them. Moses wrote Psalm 90. Psalm 90, verse 12, he said, teach us to, say it with me, number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. To number our days. I noticed on Facebook this week that uh, Chris Whittle, one of our guitarists and vocalists, uh, not on the team today, but one of our, our uh, leaders. He posted on Facebook, today I am 10,000 days old, May 25th, 2021. I laughed out loud. And then I wrote, you must have planned that comment a long time ago. <laughs> and he said, it's been on my calendar for years. <laughs> it's pretty creative. That's funny. But it's also sobering when you do start counting up your days and you see how many days and hours are already gone and you wonder how many are left. I, it prompted my imagination, so I pulled out a calculator and if I made the correct calculations, I am 21,319 days of, as of today. Unless I missed a, probably a couple leap years, threw it off, I don't know. Numbering our days, though, is not literally counting our days, but learning to recognize this truth that time is fleeting. It's like a breath, and so it matters how we use our time. And it's recognizing how valuable a resource it is and the necessity of being good stewards of it. It's remembering that true worship goes beyond Sunday and involves every day, every hour of our life. Remember the passage we reflected on a few weeks ago, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I want to look at it again with you. Therefore, Paul writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. We worship God, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week. And we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's everything we are. That includes our time, talent, and treasure. It's everything we are that we offer to Him as worship. We worship God when we serve others in His name. And that's what is revealed in the next verses. It, it, he first says, offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Then the very next verses that we're going to read in a minute, tell us one of the ways we do that. And that is by worshiping God in our serving others in His name. One Sunday, a man arrived late to church. In fact, people were already starting to come out of the church as he approached the door and he says, oh, the service must be over. And someone s responded to him and said, no, service is just beginning. True worship goes beyond Sunday. And a specific way that we worship God is by using the spiritual gifts that He's given us. We talked about this last week. If you missed it, you might want to catch up on that one. We're using the specific gifts He's given us in service to others. Here's how we offer up ourselves as a living sacrifice. Let's keep reading in Romans 12, verse 3. For by the, the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, he's going to talk about serving in the body of Christ, but he starts off by saying, let's serve in humility, not thinking that we're better than we are. 
And then he says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. He says, serve in unity. There's one body. All members count. All, all are valuable. Serve in humility. Serve in unity. And now he says, serve in diversity. We have all different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. We're all unique. God's wired us all different. Then it gives a little sampling list of some of the gifts with an encouragement. If God's given you a gift, use it. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then sign up for the Global Leadership Summit. <laughs> Hosted by Grace Place. The first Thursday and Friday of August. He says, if it is to lead, do it diligently. And leaders are learners. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And this list could continue. He's saying, hey, here's one of the ways you worship God. You offer up your time and your talent to the Lord Jesus by serving others in His name and for His glory. Amen? Amen. Watch this, would you? My name is Spencer Lucero. I'm a senior at Berthet High School and I serve on the production team here at Grace Place. Um, here at church, you'll typically see me um, running camera five, so that's the, the ninja camera we have running up on stage. Um, you'll see me scurrying around a little bit, getting all those cool artsy shots. What really got me into serving on the production team is my youth leader, Ben. Uh, at youth group one night, we had a a talk about service and how we can give back to our community, give back to our church, which has given so much to us. And he invited me to come out to one of our Wednesday night rehearsals. And he just started showing me the ropes. Like he, uh, he gave me a camera, he started showing me some of the shots that he took. Um, and I'm still trying to build my way up to where he is. But it ultimately was him inviting me that one day and it really sparked my passion for doing this. Being here at Grace Place, being here serving was really what got me coming to church every Sunday. For me, being here, being on a camera, not only did it provide me the opportunity to help and serve other people, but it provided me the opportunity to be here and learn God's Word. One of the things that I absolutely love is, and I actually have an example of this, last Sunday I was running Camera 5, that ninja camera operator, um, and I took one of the shots, I came back here to the back of the auditorium, and the entire congregation had their hands up in worship and praise. And at that moment, I, I was just astonished. It was one of those moments where it's like, you know God is in this place. And for me, it's those little moments like that where you know that what you're doing played a part in contributing to the greater good. I spend so much time with these people here that we develop these deeper relationships that help us on our walk with the Lord. It's more than just coming in on a Sunday, hearing the message and leaving. It's coming in, creating those immense, the deep relationships that not only help you in your walk in life, but help you develop in your faith. I've developed many strong relationships, both with um, pastors, with other volunteers here, um, that I know I'm gonna carry on for the rest of my life. There's so much that comes out of the rela relationships you gain from being here. The most amazing part to me is that I get to spend more time with God while also serving others, while serving the church. Grace Place's whole mission is break, breaking barriers, building bridges, and bringing hope. And that's exactly what serving does. It's, it's how God is using you through your strengths so that He can touch someone else's life. Great job, Spencer. There's a lot of joy and fulfillment that comes from serving God with others in community through the local church. 
and uh, Spencer just graduated. Congratulations to all of our graduates, graduates by the way. <clears throat> Including my wife who graduated from teaching as well, teacher of the year at Thompson Valley High School. <laughs> Would you stand with me for prayer? And uh, if you are not yet engaged or you're looking for further engagement here at Grace Place, serving through the local church and the body of Christ, please go out after this service and stop by some of those tables that are out there. They represent just some of the ministries, but ministries where we have needs. And there's people behind the tables who would love to talk to you and answer questions. Don't be in a hurry. Just go out there and talk to them. We're, they were here last week, set up, and they've set up again this week one more time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the fact that you have entered into human time. Thank you, Jesus, for your incarnation and for the redemption that you have provided for us. And thank you for reminding us of this gift of time and how important it is for us to budget our time for the important things and also stay open and aware this week for opportunities that you might bring our way as divine appointments. We want to worship you not just on Sunday, but all week long. And everybody agreed and said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. It's been great to worship with you. We got prayer partners back in that corner right back there. We'll see you.